Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us, uh, joining us online and in person uh, for this, uh, the fifth installment of the Lent term Garrod Research Seminar for the Cambridge Department of Archaeology. Uh, gathering today for a talk uh, by Professor Ogundurn. Uh, for those of you attending for the first time, this term's series titled North Atlantic Highway Materiality and Mobilities Throughout Europe, Africa, and the Americas explores themes about the North Atlantic as an inextricable force that bound individuals, communities, and their belongings in a complex web of mobilities and immobilities throughout the past. The series contributes to the larger discourse on transatlantic crossings, uh, recrossings, and material and immaterial migrations, and how descendant communities reconcile and transcend their past in the present day. Please uh, see the uh, Cambridge Archaeology YouTube channel for our previous presentations and register for the upcoming uh, talks uh, for the, at the department's website. And there'll be a link provided in the Zoom chat for both the YouTube channel and and the coming talks. My name is Joshua Fitzgerald, and I'm an ethno-historian and the current Jeffrey Rubinoff uh, Junior Research Fellow with Churchill College here in Cambridge, and I'm investigating art as a source of knowledge uh, and the science of learning in the context of Mesoamerica and early modern transatlantic world. My co-convener, Oliver Anchek, who specializes in Caribbean and Northern South American heritage studies, uh, will be uh, facilitating the conversation today. He'll take over for the question and answer, but also be managing the Zoom feed. Um, before I introduce our special guest speaker, um, uh, we'll clarify a few points. The meeting is being recorded via Zoom. Uh, all online participants should mute their microphones, but you may leave your video feed on should you so feel inclined. Uh, Professor Gundaren will speak for approximately 50 minutes which will be followed by 30 minutes of discussion. During the Q&A, Zoom attendees will be able to raise their hands uh, for us to call upon you, um, as well as uh, enter questions into the chat feed, and we'll respond to those. We can read them out for you if you'd prefer. As with all departmental functions, this will be a welcoming and safe exchange of ideas, and those in attendance online or in person should show respect to our, our distinguished speaker and to their fellow attendees. Any disruptions will result in uh, that offending party being removed. Um, note the Zoom chat will be disabled during Akeem's talk, but re-enabled during the Q&A. Please send questions or concerns directly to Oliver and I. We have enabled closed captioning, but be advised that this feature is automatically generated and provided by Zoom, and we are not responsible for its accurate depiction of what has been said. You can go back and <laughs> review the video later if you'd like. For those joining us in person, due to continued health and safety concerns, we ask that you wear a mask at all times, unless you are exempt for whatever reason, and all are obligated to vacate the building uh, right at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we can kindly then ask you to carry your conversations forth out into the outside world and uh, get a breath of fresh air. Now I am pleased to introduce Akeen Algandaran, who is the Chancellor's Professor and Professor of Africana Studies uh, anthropology and history at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte in the USA. He is also a visiting professor at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria and editor-in-chief of the African Archaeological Review. Ogundiran's scholarship has focused primarily on archaeology and cultural history of the Yoruba world and Atlantic Africa. His research has been supported by several agencies, including the National Geographic Society, Wenergren Foundation, the American Institute of Archaeology, and the American Philosophical Society. He is a, pa a past fellow of the U.S. National Humanities Center, author of several publications. Ogundiran's latest book is the, the Yoruba, a, a New History, published 2020 at Indiana University Press, winner of the Vincent Sutlev Award for the book that makes the best use of anthropological per perspectives in order to examine historical context and or the role of the past in the present. I was personally inspired in my PhD studies by his interrogation of the pre in his 2013, the end of prehistory in the AHR myself. And in 2007, Akeem was awarded a certificate of special United States congressional recognition for excellence in service. In 2018, he received the Research Excellence Award for UNESCO affiliated Center for Black Culture and International Understanding in Nigeria. Most recently, he's the recipient of the UNC Charlotte's 2021 First Citizens uh, Bank Scholars Medal Award, a very prestigious award there. Uh, furthermore, 
he was a 2018 Yip Fellow at Modlin College here in Cambridge, and we are so fortunate to have him return in person today, uh, giving us his paper entitled Sociality of Merchant uh, Capital and Archaeology of Early Modernity in Atlantic Africa. Hakeem, the floor is yours. Welcome okay. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Josh, uh, for that uh, generous introduction. I did not recognize myself at the point. Mm -hmm. talking about me. Thank you so much. And uh, good evening in the UK. Uh, good evening in other parts of Europe. Uh, good evening in Africa. And uh, I think it's good morning in the US now. <laughs> so um, I would like to start by thanking uh josh oliver and uh, elizabeth for inviting me to be part of this uh times girls lecture um i regard the university of cambridge as my own institution in europe because i spend more time here than any other institution in europe so this is always a home for me and uh, I've, I've enjoyed the generosity as well as the, 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 the just taking care of me since I arrived yesterday morning. Thank you. And I see many of my good friends and colleagues here. Thank you so much. Um, I was here in 2018, as I just said, as a, as a youth fellow. And uh, I, I, I had a good time. In fact, I completed my, my book manuscript uh, right there uh, in Modlin College. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, which is published in 2020 uh, at the Yoruba A New History. So I want to extend my gratitude to Molin College, to the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research for hosting me. Thank you so much. It's nice to see all of you. I would like to dedicate this talk uh, to all people in the world who are involved uh, in, uh, in improving the conditions of workers. Uh, irrespective of their stations. Vita uh, Continua, Victoria Asata. I think I can say that, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been asked to uh, speak to the broad theme of the 2022 late term lecture series The North Atlantic Highway, materiality and mobilities throughout <coughs> Europe, Africa, and Americas. I was fascinated by the objective of this series to examine mobility and migration uh, in the North Atlantic to understand the comparative dynamic of the different group, groups and cultural diasporas from the Americas, Africa, and Europe who lived in connection with those expansive waters. Now, uh, the description uh, was intimidating at first. After all, I don't see myself as a North Atlanticist. Uh, if anything, I'm a South Atlanticist. Mm -hmm. But I think I understand what the organizers were asking me to do. I hope I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have worked primarily uh, in West Africa, especially among the people who live on the coast as well as in the mainland of the Bay of Benin, the Yoruba community of practice. The map shows the region that I'm going to focus on this evening. My work there has focused on the impact of the Atlantic commercial revolution on the cultural and political history of that region. And uh, I have argued in some publications uh, that those West African peoples of the 15th through the 19th centuries who were co-makers of the early modern world, they were not at the periphery of it at all. Many archaeologists, historians, and cultural anthropologists uh, over the past 40 years or so uh, have dedicated their intellectual labor to underscore this point. Focusing on the region of Atlantic Africa, uh, a region that was really tied to many things going on in the world during those uh, about 400 years. The circum-Atlantic framework of several of, of those studies privilege the Atlantic slave trade and the Africanization of modernity in the Western Hemisphere. This body of work includes titles such as Akan Atlantic, Yoruba Atlantic, uh, Congo Atlantic, 
Ego, Atlantic, and many others. Uh, but this perspective has uh, been corrective to the, to the kind of Hegelian dichotomy uh, that, that treats Africa as a negation of modernity. This dichotomy uh, makes English, French, German, Spanish, Dutch, Atlantic thinkable as an early modern experience, whereas contemporaneous African experience tend to be partitioned into tradition and outside modernity at least until 1885 Berlin Conference. I have, others and I have argued that most of those African men and women uh, were already modern before they, they were caught in the, in the web of enslavement. And I will go further in saying that Africans made early modernity achieve what it claims to represent. Just, uh, just showing you the, 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 the English, Dutch, Atlantic, and other places like that. These are some of the works that, that I have been very fortunate to be part of with uh, very brilliant minds you know, in, in our field. Despite the achievement of this, uh, uh, let me actually go back a little bit. Despite the achievement of this Africa centered Sacrum Atlantic studies, there is, however, a gaping in what early modernity meant for Africans. Uh, we have sought, many of us have sought to answer this question and bring about an understanding of the African experience in the age of the Atlantic commercial revolution and the consequences of that revolution uh, on African cultural formations on both sides of the Atlantic. This work has been done in the context of uh, the archaeology of Atlantic Africa. Um, it's, this is an encompassing and trans transdisciplinary subfield that privileges not only material life and stratigraphies, but also the excavation of oratory, performance, iconography, and rituals to understand the ontology and genealogy of African of Africana modernity, Africana, not just Africa. The list of archaeologists who involved in this study keeps growing every year. Their focus is of, of two kinds. There are those who focus on African-European interactions on the coast, and there are some of us who focus on the indirect African entanglements through material networks in the, on the mainland. So uh, the, my, the title of my talk has this uh, 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 concept, sociality of merchant capital. With the background that I've provided, uh, let me quickly explain what I mean by this merchant capital. It's some that I have borrowed and repurposed to explain the commodities of the transoceanic exchanges that define the commercial revolution we are talking about in the 16th through 19th centuries. These were mass produced agricultural, manufactured, and collected items. At the top of the chart of the agricultural and manufactured merchant capital inventory are alcohol, tobacco, cowries, textiles. In Atlantic Africa, these were exchanged, as we know, for the collected merchant capital, the enslaved people. To state the obvious, the production and circulation of these items were associated with predation, displacement, regional and global transfers of labor, acts of genocide, and other types of violence. Yet, like everything else, unusual about human nature, these were objects of desire, used as threats to weave social networks across vast geographies. In this regard, these are more than commodities. They are also social objects. They gave, they created connections between people and they are also focus of interactions. They give content, shape, meaning and purpose to social relationships. What I, uh, I have done in my engagement with this object in archaeological documentary and ethnographic context is to see them as material textuality 
of commentaries. They are also material used to make commentary, debates, conversations about issues of class, gender, personhood, rights, privileges, freedom, bondage, and self-realization. So I will use a few of these items on the inventory of merchant capital to tell the story of globality and modernity in a specific Atlantic African cultural universe. Well, I drawn this talk from chapter seven of my book. Uh, that is inspiration for this talk. And I have three goals in mind. Number one, to shape, I mean, to, to share what merchant capital reveals about the logics of early African modernity. Number two, how global objects were domesticated and recomposed into new symbols and signs. And number three, to explore the agency roles of merchant capital in creating new ideas, imagination, consciousness about self, about community, and even about the world, irrespective of the geography where the individuals are located. Several scholars of materiality have used the framework of object biography, object itinerary, uh, even co object cognitive. I know this is, I'm, I'm, I'm in the second ground of materiality <laughs> in, in the world, right? And I kind of feel, I'm, I'm shaking that I'm even talking about materiality here. <laughs> uh, people have done this to make sense of material lives and their agency. But I find this concept, I mean, they're very useful, but I find them too narrow for studying the things or objects of merchant capital. Here is the reason. We are dealing with consumables. Most of the objects that I'm talking about, things that I'm talking about, they lack durability. They lack individuality. They are sometimes even flimsy and unstable, yet they are enduring. They are enduring as ideas. They are enduring as symbols. They are enduring as representations. They can be actants and serve as the subject and instrument of human interaction without even being there physically. So there are objects that were used to compose, to recompose, to even decompose social relations. That is the context in which I'm using the uh, sociality of natural capital. So a sociality approach uh, allows us to appreciate commodities as objects of knowledge, reference making, and the material transcripts of cultural formation. The cultural and uh, archaeological stratigraphies of Atlantic Africa have, uh, have shown that the generations that lived through the early modern period had relationship with, with, with the object world in a way that their, their forebears did not. They had access to far more foreign and globally cultivated, uh, circulated objects than their ancestors. And they lived in what Karin Keno Katsina called object centered environments. That is, they use objects of mostly foreign origin to situate themselves in time and place, to define status and social rank, to imagine self-realization, self to construct relationships with others, including foreigners, and to complete the world far outside their immediate reach and direct knowledge. This is evident uh, in an encounter that happened in the late morning of December 8, 1825, between Ademola, the resident commissioner of the Oyo Empire in, in the small town of Ipokia in southern Nigeria today, and Captain Hugh Clapperton, a Scot and leader of a contingent of British explorers to the Yoruba region. The explorers were seeking to document the political, cultural, and physical geography of the mainland back of Benin. This task required them to travel through the Oyo Empire. On that auspicious day, Ademola used, the, 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 the resident commissioner used the spectacle of horses and imported clothing to make his guests, Clapperton, aware of his status, to impress and warmly welcome the Europeans visitors who were on their way to see his, his lord, the king of Oyo Empire. Yeah, that would have taken about, you know, actually, it took about 30 days to get to uh, the really capital. Ademola appeared with a train of attendants. He was 
riding a horse. He had two attendants also riding the horse. There are several people behind him. So he did not just present himself. He presented a community thing, right? A community of power, of your empire power. He flamboyantly told Clapperton that he was meeting a white man, quote, for the first time, and, 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 and that this cap on his head is of white man velvet. These trousers I'm wearing of a white man's nankin. This is a white man's shirt. We get all good things from white man, and we must therefore be glad when a white man comes to visit our country. I'm sure Ademola was trying to make give uh, make a good impression on, on, on Clapperton because he felt Clapperton will report how well he was received or how bad he was received to the king of Oyo. So he had to make a very good scene. To further burnish this imagery of long distance connection of his empire and that of the European material world, the youngest member of Ademola's entourage, a five or six year old boy, was dressed up in an oversized red European coat with a tail that dragged on the ground. The boy did not wear pants, but he spotted a military cap with an imprint of the Portuguese crown on the front. With this visual material and uh, rhetorical spectacle, Ademola informed Clapperton that the, the Atlantic material world connected the two of them. It might have been the first time that a European ventured that deep into the territory of the European empire. But the empire has, had been interacting with European agents on the coast for about 200 years. In fact, it was the empire's interest in the coastal trade that Ademola represented in Bokia, the mandate of this provincial governor was to promote trade, protect trade routes, maintain peace, collect tributes, uh, and some pike levies, and foster the loyalty and subordination of the Bokia, the Bokia's political leaders to the will of the metropolis. It is striking but not surprising that this Ademola Clapperton encounter was mediated by visual that drew from the symbol of the empire's power and, and the Atlantic commercial life. The horses represented the imperial power for you, and the white man's goods, Nankin, uh, velvet, embodied the material experience of the Atlantic commercial revolution. These traded items represented the Atlantic worldliness of Ademola and Clapperton and other members of their social class. The encounter of these agents of two Atlantic age empires is useful for thinking about what Atlantic modernity meant to the various African peoples. It is also an entry into the Oyo empire. Covering about two thirds of the Yoruba speaking world, the empire brought the coastal experience to the mainland and the African mainland experience to the coast. It used political, demographic, economic, and cultural policies to influence the Atlantic experience of millions of people in the region between 1600 and 1836. Thinking through or thinking about material mobility and immobility in the Atlantic highway brings to focus questions about archaeological assemblage. How the Atlantic merchant capital was juxtaposed with the African merchant capital, and how both were used to compose new identities and realities at the domestic and corporeal context. The sartorial spectacle that we come across in the entourage of Ademola's bodily presentation has resonances in domestic spaces where the juxtaposition of local and foreign wares also calls attention to the social, commercial, and gastronomic networks of their residents. One example out of many is the layout of a room in MJR1, a compound within the inner wall of Oyo. Ile, you are looking at the, 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 the map of uh, Oyo, Ile, the capital of the Oyo Empire. And next to it is uh, one of the residences that we excavated here. At the time that the city was uh, evacuated in the dry season of 1836, fragments of European imports, such as French glassware, English stoneware, 
gin and, and aguardiente bottles, cowries and African tobacco pipes were left behind. And this is about 320 kilometers from the coast. The Oyo Empire did not own a single trading port, but it controlled the coastal kingdoms and principalities of the coast who had those ports. So the levies on those coastal principalities ensure that the king of Oyo received some of the inventory of each ship as tributes. Scores of roads, colonies, way stations link the metropolis to the coast. And during the 17th, 18th, and early 19th century, merchant capital traveled to ULA through tribute and trading networks. In MGR1 compound, most of the imported items showed up in the southwest corner of the residence. You don't see them uh, 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 randomly distributed. They are concentrated on the southwest corner of the household. Important storage ports and bowls are also located there, all indicating that the power and control of the household resided in that corner of the building. With this juxtaposition of blue rimmed glass a bowl produced in France and Northern Europe between 1718 and 1810, stoneware from England, gin glass bottle with local tobacco pipes, serving and storage pots. We can imagine the kinds of conversation and sociality that were taking place in the veranda and courtyards of this residence. The conversation will have included uh, admiration of the glassware, the acts of pleasure and hospitality that accompany the consumption of, of, the, of the fire water, you know, fire water is abundant, uh, uh, coming from sugarcane in Brazil. It should not surprise us that some of these foreign objects or materials were often utilized in ways that were different from the intention of the original makers. For example, uh, Clapperton observed in, 18, in 1827 that the king of Oyo used a white chamber pot as the container of his colonies. Mm -hmm. And this was carried, well, I hope they were clean. <laughs> <laughs> and this was carried by one of the palace staff wherever the king went. So it must have been a, a, a part of a lit presentation to have your colonel, an indigenous product, in this imported uh, uh, enamel. Objects, uh, of course, often change meaning during their life course, through time and space, especially when they travel from one cultural zone to the other. Some of those imported fabrics that Ademola poetically talked about during his meeting with Clapperton were the court resown to make damage of the Egungun, the Yoruba ancestral masculine. This is uh, very important, worshiping the, the ancestors incorporated merchant capital in this, re in this recomposition, imported silk, brocade, and velvet competed for attention with locally made fabrics. In life and death, this material transcripts tell the story of the worldliness and the global connection of Atlantic Africa with Europe and Asia. An important contribution of archaeology to the sociality of merchant capital is the access it gives us into the different contexts of materiality and how class mediated the discursive practices associated with merchant capital. Documentary sources show that the coastal African elite who interacted directly, di directly with European merchants and through them with European monarchs and governors of European colonies in South America. They had relationships with the Atlantic world in ways that the, main, the mainland monarchs, such as the Alakim of Oyo, uh, uh, did not. These African great merchants and human traffickers, like King Kosoko of Lagos, were tied to the credit debt networks with the European human traffickers along the trading ports in West Africa and as far as Brazil and Portugal. Let me give you an example. Kings Tebesu, Agunglo, Atanduzan, and Gezo of Dahomey, four successive kings, sent copious correspondences and ambassadors 
to their counterparts in Lisbon and to the governor of Bahia. The purpose of those exchanges was to improve and sustain the commercial relationship between Dao and Portugal. Historians Robin Law and Hanna Lucia Arahudu, among others, have written about these correspondences. In one of these letters by Ada Dozan, dated October 9, 1810, he referred to Prince Regent John of the Portuguese Empire as his brother and commiserated with him and Queen Maria over the events that forced the transfer of the Portuguese royal court to Brazil in 1807. Moreover, he regretted not being able to assist his brother uh, uh, in the fight against Napoleon. In that same letter, Adadozan had asked the Prince Regent for, quote, some Columbrina rifles, white and red, uh, white and red wine, aguardente, and liquors of several kinds, some 40 lap puppies, some peacock pears. I am asking you because I want to have all these things to cause admiration in my people. For them to say to, to themselves, my king does not know how to read and write, but he owns so many beautiful things of the world people. However, at the center of these exchanges, of niceties and gift exchanges, was the tension over the control of trade in the Atlantic littoral. These four kings of Daomi accused the Portuguese Brazilian merchants of reducing the quality of merchant capital they were bringing to the Battle of Benin. For example, King Agumblo complained in a letter to Queen Maria in 1795 about the reduction in the weight of the tobacco rolls being imported from Bahia to Wida. His son, Adaduza, also complained that the stockkeeper of the Portuguese fort in Wida was adding water to the barrels of Aguardente with, with which he bought Daomi's captives. So there was always tension behind these nice expressions they were sending to one another. The experience and desire that these kings had with the material world of merchant capital were different from the middle and lower class population. Most never had access to more than tobacco and cows. Therefore, as archaeologists, we are confronted by the question, what do we do with the presence and absence of merchant capital at our sites? What do these tell us about class, identity, and sociality? What stories can we tell with these presences and absences? Um, when, when Ademola flattered, flattered Captain Clapperton that his empire received all good products from the Europeans, he forgot, he forgot to mention that Nankin, Silk, and Damask were not the primary products that European traders exchanged for the captives. It was tobacco. This was the primary currency of the Atlantic slave trade along the shores of the Battle of Benin from 1650 to 1850. The consumption of tobacco was so pervasive that there is no 17th through 19th century archaeological site that we have excavated <laughs> Uh, on the mainland or on the coast, where tobacco pipes were not found. Cameron Monroe has discussed the large scale production of tobacco pipes in Albany, for example, under the control of the king. And based on the work of Roderick and uh, Susan McIntosh, we know that large scale production of tobacco pipes was also taking place in the Western Sudan during the 17th and 18th centuries. In a refuse man that I excavated in uh, Elio Shubu in Nigeria as well, we collected more than 70 tobacco pipes from just 10 by 8 meter excavated unit, barely 60 centimeters deep. These pipes were so important that some, some of the damaged ones were even sometimes repaired and they might have been treated as heirloom. In the neighboring town of Edele, a few of these pipes were personalized and decorated with symbols, uh, such as the stylized imagery of an owl and a ram found in the governor's house. These images communicate power. The owl with his big eyes, big head, sharp and sharp talons, and upright stance is a symbol of 
powerful mothers. The Yoruba call them Maje, but when we, we translate them, they come out as witches in English, but they are not exactly the same. These women are associated with creation, healing, destruction, spiritual and physical development, and fortification. The ram imagery stands for strength, ferocity, and the symbol is often associated with political astuteness and domination. But these pipes do not tell the whole story about tobacco usage. For every gram of tobacco smoke in a pipe, perhaps 20 grams were chewed or snuffed. The archaeological profiles show that the widespread use of tobacco was adopted during the 17th century. The tobacco that filled these pipes was, however, not produced in the back of Benin. It came from Brazil. For about 200 years, a brand of tobacco called Refugado was produced in Bahia specifically for West African markets. This brand originated from the low gray tobacco leaves that were liberally doused with molasses to keep them from excessive molding or drying out. The aroma and sugar content of this low gray uh, uh, was an instant success in the part of the world. Generations of men and women developed and acquired an addictive taste for it. It became, quote, an indispensable article of the slave trade. So we don't need to come up with any sexy reason for the American slave trade. Tobacco sustained the slave trade in the Battle of Benin because of addiction. 96% of Brazilian refugado carrying ships that arrived in West Africa between 1681 and 1710, for example, disembarked in the Battle of Benin, as this uh, uh, chart shows. Uh, the pattern was not so much different for, the, for most of the 18th and uh, 19th century. The tobacco was primarily exchanged for enslaved people. The business was so profitable, yielding a 45% profit margin on each earthly enslaved African bought for eight rolls of tobacco in the Battle of Benin and safely landed in Brazil. So we can see tobacco as we can say that tobacco was the first truly global commodity, the most widely and rapidly distributed item in the Colombian exchange. Tobacco usage was central to the consumption of Atlantic modernity in different parts of the world, not just in Africa. In the Battle of Benin, tobacco financed the, the Atlantic slave trade. It established credit debt, debt networks that stretched hundreds of kilometers from the littorals to the mainland. In fact, it was through tobacco consumption that most Yoruba and other West Africans, uh, 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 as far as Central Sudan, tested the bitterness and sweetness of LA modernity through snuffing, chewing, smoking, and the slave mill. The tobacco pipe and the paraphernalia of snuffing and smoking were individuality of family objects. The tobacco consumption communicated taste, pleasure, leisure, and class. This was the case for the Yoruba and other peoples in Atlantic Africa. For the Yoruba in particular, tobacco smoking was also a gender performance that privileged masculinity. The Yoruba sculptures of the 17th through 19th centuries are replete with adult male figures smoking tobacco pipes. You will not see in this imagery uh, pubescent figures or women. This stereotypical representation, however, notwithstanding, women of post menopausal age or of independent authority also smoked tobacco because these women were considered as social males in the Yoruba cultural universe. Tobacco smoking demarcated and reinforced class boundaries. In the 18th century and early 19th centuries, for example, many prominent personalities did not go for a public housing without taking with them the paraphernalia of tobacco. For example, the large entourage of King Adele that visited Clapperton in Badagri in 1826 included not only his political chieftains, military captains and advisors, but also the servants who carried the king's tobacco pipe and, and spittoon. 
Yeah, you guys were smoking and also chewing at the same time. <laughs> Alafin, the king of Oyo, uh, was also accompanied in his haltings by a spittoon bearer. So uh, in this acquired state and addictive uh, consumption of, of the Atlantic period, the elite were able to put authority and respectability on display through the public array of tobacco paraphernalia, spittoon, tobacco pipe, tobacco pouch bearers. That of all the merchant capital of the Atlantic slave trade, though, the item that circulated and exchanged hands the most in the Battle of Guinea and the mainland was the cowrie shell. Yes, I've written quite a bit <laughs> on cowrie shells, and it's just an object that I'm always fascinated to talk about because you can never ex you can never exhaust its 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 biography. It's just there, something. There's always something need to see about it. And uh, perhaps by, by the end of my talk, you will notice why one continues to see so much in that tiny object. <laughs> it was the most durable of all Atlantic merchant capital. Next to the Brazilian tobacco, uh, it was the second most dominant Atlantic commodity in the Battle of Benin by volume and value. By converting cowries into the primary medium of exchange, including payment of goods, services, debts, credits, and political liabilities, such as paying your taxes, your tolls, and levies, the political elite across West Africa succeeded in co-opting the populace as participants in the commodity slave exchange. The ubiquity of Monita Kauri in the archaeological deposits of the 17th through mid 19th century across West Africa in residential, barrier, medium market, and manufacturing context shows that these Indian Ocean shells integrated the region into intercontinental markets and tied the domestic production to the Atlantic merchant capital. Imagine you can travel 1,000 miles. You don't have to worry about what you will use to buy things or what you will get for it. Your, your, your currency was the same. Senegal, whether you were in Nigeria, whether you were in Yahusa land, you were able to exchange things for currency. So we're talking about economic integration in West Africa. Oh, we did that already. <laughs> <laughs> we did that already, you know? <laughs> yeah, uh, I would argue that in fact, the North or South Atlantic world would not have been as busy as it was during the early modern period without the cowrie commodity network that linked the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. At least 70% of the estimated 6.6 6 to 8 trillion cows imported to, to West Africa between 1550 and 1850 were offloaded in the Battle of Benin. This flood of cowrie shells served as the basis for monetizing the Yoruba economy after 1630, plugging the economy of the region into the other cowrie currency zones that stretch from the Battle of Biafra to Senegambian Valley and Central Sudan. Cowries were the most evocative object in the Yoruba Atlantic experience, as Hai and other scholars have demonstrated. They serve as the, as the medium and symbol for articulating the revolutionary impact of merchant capital, especially the ideas about personhood, self-realization, and globality. In other words, the cowrie was at the center of contemplating and generating understanding about the world, including the evolving social changes that arose from predation, empire, slavery, displacement, dismemberment of corporate family units, and scattering of people across the ocean. For these reasons, Cowrie became the material transcripts for documenting the disputations and critical commentaries about the nature of the Atlantic commercial revolution and the place of the individual and the community in it. Once again, class mediated this dialogue. Therefore, while the political elite on the coast developed celebratory narratives about merchant capitalism and cowries, the exploited class admonished the elite for the social damages caused by the Atlantic commercial revolution. 
Let me give you one example. In the royalist oral traditions of the Bene Kingdom, it associated the prosperity brought by Kauri currency with the king, with the reign of Oba Eresonye, Eres who ruled in Benin between 1735 and 1737. According to one version, the boom in the supply of cowries during the 18th century, which was the peak of the Atlantic free trade, was a product of the peace pact and cosmo cosmological balance between the king and Olokun, the deity of the ocean and wealth in Benin and Yoruba world. But as the late uh, Michel of Trullo reminded us, naivete could be a good instrument of mass deception by those who exercise power. But it is often a grave mistake for those on whom that power is exercised uh, to buy into this naivete. Considering that human cargo paid for calories brought to the shores of the Battle of the Name, it is not surprising that there were other narratives in West Africa uh, 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 that gives us different stories. One of those stories come from the Ayuso, uh, a, a coastal people in the, in, in the Battle of Benin, present day Benin Republic. They say that in the beginning of the world, we had a forge and we forged things. We had weaving looms and we wove our clothes. We had boats from which we caught fish. We had no guns, we had no cargo. If you went to the market, you took beans in order to exchange them for sweet potatoes. You exchange something for something. Then the king of Alada and Daomi brought cowrie money. What did the king do in order to bring the cowrie money? He cut people and broke their legs and their hands. Then he built a hut in the banana plantation, put the people in it, and fed them bananas until they, be until they became fat and big. The king killed the people and he gave orders to his servants to attach strings to their bodies and to throw them in, into the ocean where the cowrie shells lived. When the cowrie shells started to eat the corpses, they pulled them in, collected the shells, and put the live cowries in hot water to kill them. That is how cowrie money came to exist. So you can see the difference between the dominant class and the dominated class, how they were representing their Atlantic experiences. That's why it's important for us as historians, as archaeologists, to listen to multiple voices so that we can have a, a, a more robust understanding of the experience of time. Between 1600 and 1830, the Ayuso were vassals of the king of Alada. They later came under the control of the Daomi. They were ready for captives. They were, they were forced to include their men and women in the annual tributes paid to their overlords. Most of these individuals became part of the human cargo loaded on the slave ship. The Ayuso story is an indictment of the predatory states and brigand merchants whose wealth depended on the slave cowrie exchange. Their story frames the advent of cowrie currency and the wealth it signifies in zero sum terms. The growth of of the elite wealth is the depletion of their own family members, right? Here, wealth was conceptualized as finite and its production could only be drawn from the property and vital energies of someone else. Cowries also serve as the social valuation index for how individuals perceive themselves in relation to others in the world, including places far beyond the Atlantic horizons. For example, in October 1827, the Chamberlain and the political advisor of the King of Oyo pulled Cornish explorer Richard Lander aside and showed him a small room in his palace apartment filled with cowards, exuding an air of boastfulness and pride. The Chamberlain asked his guest whether the King of England was as rich as himself. He did not find any other merchant capital uh, as useful as Cowley. Uh, for comparing his wealth with that of the monarch in far away place called the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. Richard Lander was offended, of course, by this comparison, and he said what he should not have said to his host. For doing that, he almost lost a limb on that occasion <laughs> for his lack of diplomacy. 
as a social capital. The Kauri fueled the Chamberlain's imagination of connectivity. He was trying to make a connection between him and his guest. So when we encounter Kauri's in the archaeological context, we're invited to ask what dialogues took place in the process and at the final point of deposition. As we now know, the investment of Kauri with the attributes of universal convertibility increased the density of cultural profile. The mutuary context account for a substantial part of this cultural density. I will use my excavation of a barrier in, uh, in uh, Edele, uh, of a barrier in Edele to illustrate this point. The barrier was that of an individual, a blacksmith about 20 to, 23, 20, 20 to 25 years old, who lived in the 18th or early 19th century. On his death, he was buried in a fertile position. Five cowries were placed on top of his head, and Harold, a serving bowl, possibly containing food when he was buried. A piece of iron slag was buried with him, placed between his thighs. Two meters behind him is a blacksmithing pit furnace. The individual died as a young adult. He had likely not realized most of his potentials when he died, and his, his burial goods were modest. The five cowries delicately placed on his forehead marked him out as a man of the Atlantic age, a man that did not batter his iron products for, for, for sweet potatoes, then batter them, you know, then exchange them for money, cowries. It is also possible that that these five cowries were meant to come to call on his, 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 his destiny, uh, the, the, the deity of destiny in the Yoruba pantheon, uh, to help the deceased successful transition into the ancestral world. This, this, this deity of personality and destiny uh, 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 had occupied a central place in Yoruba metaphysics for, uh, 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 for I mean, from at least the 11th century, when stylized terracotta cone-shaped human hairs represented the destiny of the lineage or corporate group were placed on the ancestral shrines alongside the naturalistic sculptures of named, of named ancestors. Such assemblages, like the one discovered by Peter Gullick in uh, Obalara site in Ileife, and which is illustrated here, suggests that the destiny of the deceased, uh, represented by the naturalistic figure, was intimately linked to the collective destiny of the lineage, represented by stylized comical figures. This linkage was, however, weakened during the 17th and 18th centuries. When the Atlantic Commercial Revolution moved the primary means of wealth accumulation to the market space, making it easier for the individual to, to accumulate wealth outside the resources of their household and lineage. You know, you don't have to rely on the labor of your family members. You can actually buy labor, you know, independent of your family. So as a result of this trend of individualized accumulation by, by the early 18th century, the iconography of destiny and personhood changed from the stylized and naturalistic human terracotta apes to Pass to impersonal, symbolic, and abstract forms. The form is this pyramid-shaped shrine you're looking at called Ileori, you know, the, which is the container of another smaller piece uh, beside it called the body. This is the, the, the individual spiritual head and symbol of personhood. The making and consecration of and the consecration of the shrine to one's Uri was an important milestone in the life course. It marked the state of full consciousness of a person's mission in life. It was a celebration that an individual was on the path of achieving their potentiality as a divine being. However, not everyone could afford to make a shrine of the Uri, but everyone prayed to their deity of individuality. The reason is that making a shrine of Ori uh, was, was an expensive venture. In the late 18th and early 19th century, it would cost as much as 16,000 cows to complete this ritual and the ceremonies associated with it. This was a lot of money. 
enough to purchase two or three cows or to purchase a prime adult slave, a, a prime adult male slave in, early, in the early 19th century. The exorbitant price of making and debutting an orange shrine might be celebrated, however, as a successful person. What is striking, though, is that upon the death of the individual, the shrine must be destroyed. And the relatives of the individual will share the money among themselves. The wealth or liquid asset of merchant capital was really inherited or formed the basis of social mobility for the descendants. Several barriers in Yoruba cultural area dating to this period contain various numbers of cowries. In this mortuary context, cowries represent the material evidence of interaction between the diseased and their survivors, as well as messages the survivors were sending to the other world on behalf of the diseased. We have also seen that cowries were concealed away under the floors of houses, sometimes in pots or sacks. We don't think these were ritual acts but likely secreting fiscal prudence that the owner forgot about. Another context we have found are the meetings or ref refuse. Previous finds of cowries uh, in refuse mounds have been interpreted as items discarded, you know, as trash. The cowries found in these meetings, however, are generally in good condition and they sometimes occur in numbers uh, large enough to negate the possibility that they were all lost by an unwary or careless visitors. <laughs> okay, the meaning among the Yoruba is not just a place where you throw your trash. It's also a sacred place. Sacred because that is where malevolent forces frequent. Malevolent forces are called ajogun. That is where they go. These are these are powers or forces that cause misfortunes in the world, okay? As a result, a refuge site or a meeting can be a site of sacrificial deposition.
some were employed in farming, mining, and the sundry of crafts. The empire also relied on these men and, on, and women of bondage for its economic well being and security. But by the end of the 19th century, uh, social mobility was increasingly becoming difficult, even for the citizens who are on the lower rungs of the social ladder, uh, due to the dwindling economic fortunes of the empire. The last quarter of the century was marked by also declining returns from the Atlantic slave trade, <laughs> poor harvest due to the exhausted farmlands and, uh, and the frequent episodes of, of drought. The political... <laughs> The political instability of, in, in Europe and the spillover effects on the, on the American colonies, as well as the rising tide of, of, of abolition efforts, also reduced the number of slave ships visiting the Battle of Guinea during the early 19th century. The social impacts of this economic and ecological, uh, 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 of these ecological stresses were worsened by the rising abuse of power by the desperate elite. There's no time in this talk to review all of these details, uh, 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 but all of this began to unravel in West Africa at the end of the 18th century. We are now entering the period of the West African age of revolution. About the very same time that the North Atlantic from Europe to the America embarked on their own revolutionary period. Slavery and social disc discontentment associated with the production and distribution of merchant capital lay the foundation of this age in the At Atlantic world, irrespective of where you are. But as Paul Lovejoy and I have argued independently, historians and archaeologists have not given West Africa its due consideration as part of this age of re revolutions. In 1817, the Oyo metropolitan crisis that began in the mid 18th century culminated in a massive revolt of the enslaved and the underclass citizens. The, the insurgents fought their way out of the capital to join a growing anti-metropolitan metropolitan resistance in Ilorin about 60 kilometers away. These insurgents caused confusion on, on their part the quest for freedom from bondage and arbitrary power was no doubt an important reason for this slave underclass revolt. However, the immediate catalyst for, for this unrest uh, 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 was the shortage of food and intense hunger in the capital due to the spike in the incidences of drought uh, 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 in, the, in, in, the, in the early 19th century. So the French Revolution is not the only one that can teach us something about how the simmering discontentment of the underclass due to the elite arbitrary power and lack of social mobility could be transformed into a spontaneous revolt by the hyper shortage of the staple food. The 1870 revolt in Oyo is one of the underclass revolts in Atlantic Africa that have not made it to the age of revolution of literature. One of our goals in our study, ongoing study in Oyo metropolis, is to understand the living conditions of the, of the underclass, the kind of people likely to have joined this 1817 revolt. Akwaje Williams has conducted the most systematic survey in Oyo Ile and, and identified the northern outskirts of the capital uh, over there as the quarters where the enslaved underclass lived. We believe this was where the horse stables and the cattle pen of the elite were located. We, are, we have also been mapping and excavating one of the towns uh, on the outskirts of the capital that housed many of the dependent populations. This is Barra, a small town of 6.5 kilometers in circumference, located 2.5 kilometers from your elite itself. This is one of the most important towns in the metropolitan area because the kings of Oyo were buried here. Many of the palace officials who served the kings also were moved there when the king died uh, to administer to the, to the departed king who are now uh, 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 part of the deity. The 
preliminary research showed that the settlement landscape of this of this small town was partitioned along class lines, with the lower class occupying the western part of the settlement, while the high-ranking re residents occupied on the, the, the eastern part. The excavation of one of the uh, residential quarters, what we call W600, on the western wing of the settlement re revealed barrack-like longhouses. This contrasts with the impluvium houses that are the standard architectural features of Oyoile. Moreover, the spatial arrangements of the artifacts found in these longhouses have no coherent organization in contrast to those in the impluvium architecture. It was notable that those black and gray wares associated with food service and cooking in typical of your residences, they were, they were very rare in these underclass residences. In fact, they accounted for only 5% of the ceramic assemblage, as opposed to about 30 to 45% that you will see in a regular household. So our conclusion is that W600 was not a self-generating uh, 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 residential unit. Uh, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a place that was dependent on food rations coming from the centrally organized uh, uh, political system. The instability and massive population displacement that preceded and followed the 1817 underclass revolt led to the disintegration of the empire in 1836. Uh, of course, Brazil, Cuba, and Trinidad were, uh, were among the beneficiaries of this crisis. During this time, half a million Yoruba people arrived in South America and the Caribbean uh, in the 19th century. That is about 50% of all enslaved Yoruba who entered the Middle Passage between 1600 and uh, 1860. The Yoruba arriving in the New World from the late 18th century were aware of the material world of the Atlantic Commercial Revolution. And the irony of the relationship between their material world and the American plantation system could not have been lost on them. In fact, the consumption component of the Atlantic modernity was already part of their lives uh, or their cultural tra tradition, okay? So what was going on in West Africa, not just among the Yoruba, but along the coast or in the mainland were debates, the questions about what constituted I mean, what is the meaning of a person? When that person could be exchanged for eight rolls of tobacco? That is a question that you will not find in any archival source. But you have to pay attention to the mythologies of the Odisha Pantheon in order to gain access to that question and how people are trying to answer those questions. The question was being uh, articulated textually in the Orisha myth historical discourses okay, uh, of Obatala, uh, Oshun, Yemaja, deities. The elaborate commentaries in this mythology and their ritual fields uh, uh, critique excess commodification, devastating effects of slavery, protection of the weak and the handicapped and the rest of women. These, uh, these three deities are, are actually talking about that. But you will not see that narrative in Shango. Shango is the patron deity of your empire. So it's about power. It's not about, it's not about equality, right? And uh, the most, the, the most uh, uh, neutral of all Yoruba deities issue. It was also implicated in this. Uh, 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 issue was appropriated by your empire as the patron deity of those imperial servants and provincial governors. So when you see the imagery of issue, you will see cowrie shells, you will see brass on it, you will see, of course, other local content because issue is the okay, the, the the patron deity of those collecting those things for the empire. Uh, let me now begin to wrap this up. Uh, the material transcripts of merchant capital in, in Atlantic Africa come from archaeological deposits, mythology, or a tradition, documentary sources. They afford us the opportunity to explore some of the moments and ideas that shaped and uh, unfolded Atlantic modernity in West Africa at different scales, from the intimate residential units to the international networks of the states, uh, 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 as well as uh, uh, of uh, merchants and ordinary people. So one of the uh, intriguing and confounding shared experiences of early modernity 
is addictive consumption. If we are wondering how tobacco addiction could have financed the slave trade in the Battle of Benin, let us not forget that it was the addictive taste for Brazilian tobacco, sorry, for Brazilian alcohol that financed most of the slave trade in Central Africa. These addictive tastes were not limited to Africa though. As you very well know, the British, for example, flooded the Chinese market with American silver and later opium. Why? Of course, you know the answer, right? Because of the addiction to tea, the Chinese tea. So uh, the juxtaposition of, of, of Atlantic world experience challenges us to move therefore away from this false dichotomy of Hegelian dialectics where Africa represented uh, uh, a negation of and a necessary antithesis to the rational West. Every experience of Atlantic modernity was as rational or irrational as every community of practice chose to define it. But we have to admit that the dire consequences of, of merchant capital and the speciality for Africa and the African diaspora continue to be with us today. Therefore, we should heed Peter Eke's appeal that the sociological and historical meanings of modern African phenomena will emerge most fully if they are traced to their roots in the centuries of the Atlantic slave trade, that is, in the early modernity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Olumbier and so much for your talk. I think we all took uh, a lot from, from that, despite the little technical hiccup. We'll yeah. all um, have plenty to reflect on um, and build on in our own work, I think, from, from your fantastic work. Um, so I'd like to open the floor now to some questions. We can field questions both in person here and online. So if you're online, please either raise your hand or uh, put it in the chat, the question in the chat, and we'll read it out to Professor Oluwiran. Um, in the meantime, does anybody have a question or shall I start? Just one person. We have someone oh. online. Okay. We have a raised hand online. Norman yeah. Hammond. Norman Hammond. Norman Hammond. Yeah, um, you're not allowing me to be seen on screen, unfortunately. Yeah, sorry. I love to see you. I'm a teacher. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There we okay. Go. Okay. Can you see me now, Akeen? Yes, I can see you. No, how are you? Okay, great. Nice to see you. Um, I had a question. Um, around about 1700, you get this sudden shift from uh, tobacco trade into Angola, um, and uh, it shifts up to the Bight of Benin. Um, is this because of a diminution in supply of human cargo in Angola, or is it that the slave trade is becoming much more efficiently organized in the Bight of Benin from inland, so that the Brazilians are actually able to um, acquire their slaves at a, a, a much um, uh, more efficient rate? Um, and then um, my other question, which I think you answered uh, after the interruption, was what parallels do you see between the tobacco trade uh, into West Africa and the opium trade by the English into China slightly later on? Thank you. Uh, by the way, let me salute my former teacher. Uh, well, not former teacher, always it's my teacher. Uh, uh, we're together at Boston University. So thank you, no? For that question, when you say hear the name, no, I'm I'm shaking. Oh, you're gonna quiz me again, like a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, there was no really a shift in the tobacco trade. What happened is that every every region of Atlantic Africa uh, had its own commodity specialization. So tobacco was always uh, uh, what the battle of Benin consumed. In Angola or in Central Africa, it was alcohol. So as tobacco was being used to finance slave trade in the Bight of Benin, alcohol was being used to finance slave trade in, in, in Central Africa. So, so alcohol also came to West Africa, but not in the same quantity as in Central Africa, in Congo area. Okay, and there's a very fascinating book by Usukoto on, on, on this. On, on uh, alcohol trade 
into Central Africa. It's very fascinating. So, yeah. So, uh, regarding the second question, uh, yes, I that yeah, 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 parallels uh, with the you know, consumption of tea in Europe and, 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 and what that eventually, that was tied to not just consumption, it was tied to also social class, it was tied to social organization. So the success of any commodity was not just about consumption. It's always tied to how society was organized. And once you begin to, to, to tamper with that, once you have a system going and you tamper with it, of course, it will lead to other changes. So uh, that, that equilibrium, that's why it tends to survive or succeed for quite some time, you know, 200, 300, 400 years before some shift will then cause deviation from it. Okay, and very neat excavations, Akeen. It's difficult in a tropical forest to do it that way. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from our audience online? All right, I have a question for you. Um, I was struck by uh, one of the things you said, which was that several of the key materials of merchant capital were um, lack of durability and were rather flimsy, mm -hmm. but they're enduring symbols and durable in the memories of people nowadays. Mm -hmm. and I wondered if you could develop a little further how those are memorialized nowadays and perhaps those, the implications on heritage management and museum collections, hmm. considering that they are not so enduring in a sense. Hmm. Thank you. Well, if you have, well, for those of us who work in West Africa, when you go to visit a chief or a king or a chieftain, anything, you have to bring a bottle of shina. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, it's almost really. The stronger it is, the more it is perceived that you take them seriously. That's the high hardcore content that you have. Right? Likewise, to worship certain male deities, including my own, Ogun, you need very strong alcohol. Now, we are not consuming high level alcohol in West Africa until 1600s. <laughs> We consume palm wine, we consume uh, uh, millet beer, it is very mild. So now these deities now began to, to, to take him very, very strong fire water, aguardente, rum. All of these things were tied to the Atlantic exchange. They were not there before. <laughs> okay? And but up to today, we are still engaging in that, right? Across West Africa, I mean, well, what, let me say across West Africa because that is very uh, broad. Along the coast and the immediate internet, where you do not have Islamic influence as such. Um, Yoruba, for example, uh, Igbo, for example, uh, the stronger the alcohol content or the higher the alcohol content, the, the, the better mm -hmm. for the spirituality. Mm -hmm. Now, not every deity does, you know, I think that. Uh, what I skipped in my presentation is that there are certain deities that were against that as part of the dialogue going on. Oshun, uh, Obatala, deities, for example, they shunned alcohol. They see it as unclean. Oshun, they cannot smoke tobacco in their presence. This is part of their resistance of two things. They were resisting the empire that, or your empire that fostered that, that consumption. They were also making commentary on the effects of the Atlantic slave trade on the provinces because the, the provincial towns were losing out. They were losing their members to the Atlantic slave trade. They were losing their members to the labor demands by the imperial capital. So, and therefore, they were, they were also therefore uh, uh, resisting, or let me say, uh, they were making commentary by, by by shunning or by, 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 by preventing those kind of commodities to enter their mutual space. So you see dialogues between the imperial power and the politics and what they do and what they do not do. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? 
I'll say one. Really, to, be able to drop my mask for a couple of minutes. <laughs> it's lovely being back in the seminar room here. Um, this is a very vague question. Forgive me if it doesn't sort of quite resonate. But the, the wonderful kind of work you've done and others have done on the West African state trade has been an inspiration for many years for archaeologists who were looking at slavery 2,000 years earlier. Mm. Um, say in the, the Western Mediterranean, the classic work people like Michael Dietler mm. between Massalia and 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 and, and Europe. Mm. Um, does the intellectual flow work the other way? Do you find the kind of work that they do mm. as archaeologists interesting and informative for what you do? And what are the kind of differences that you put a very heavy, heavy emphasis on this concept of early modernity and the mm. kind of materiality to dialogue the discourse mm. of early modernity mm. obviously each and complex society for work in the mediterranean has to work very differently yeah. but do you find do you read that kind of literature do you find it does it change the way you think about this kind of stuff mm. as an archaeologist or is it all as so often <laughs> the yeah, other yeah, way yeah, yeah. <laughs> well um i think africans <laughs> we read broadly it's very well known as my colleagues here will say see no uh we i read their work uh, 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 there are certain things to take away from the, con the way they conceptualize slavery, the way they conceptualize uh, interactions and exchange. They are very, I find it useful. I don't think they are reading us those though as much. But also, we are looking at different contexts. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, slavery, chatter slavery. And the and the modality, the, the organization of the of the Atlantic slave trade was different uh, from the kinds of uh, what will have been the pre-Atlantic slavery systems. You know, uh, as Paul Lovejoy said, you know, many times in his book Transformation of Slavery in, in Africa, uh, he said that when Africa, whenever Africa was connected to to external slavery, it transformed nature of inequality and slavery within Africa itself, right? So um, slavery mode of production took place in very few places in, 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 the, in, in Atlantic Africa, uh, because there was just nothing. Because African commodities lost value in the early modern world, right? Well, in the, in, in the, in the 15th century, in the 16th century, community production was still, for example, the Yoruba cloth. Yoruba cloth was being sold as far as New York and, and, and Brazil up till the end of the 16th century. But by 1630, nothing that Africa was producing had value in the, in the external world. With that, the focus was on so that for, for merchants to even store their wealth of value. We have to study our working people. You see, so that so that because there, there's nothing you can use to store wealth except gold, mm. you know, which is the elite control. So your kola not had no had no global value, your cloth had no global value. So this is how external trade transformed local indigenous relationship as well. Because people then have to study their wealth in people because they know that they can transform that individual into, into wealth eventually. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the parallels that we see, or let me say differences as well that we see when we look at other places where the, the, the enslaved could be used to produce commodities of wider value. Uh, from the 1600s, that became difficult in Atlantic Africa. Can I come up with, a, yeah. with a, a, another comment? So in a sense, you, you, you've talked a lot of, very interestingly about the kind of common denominator of the Cowrie mm -hmm. economy, but if you were to sort of look at the dynamics of East Africa, Indian Ocean mm -hmm. dynamics, do you feel it's a similar story to what you've just described to us, to a subject of technology, or is it what you make it different? It's similar. Uh, after, I mean, uh, if, if we're talking about the same period, right, it's very similar uh, in, to some extent. Um, because we are, you know, the world was connected to one another. You know, people are labor was scarce, and the people. The only way to get there was no wage labor. <laughs> the only way to produce uh, beyond your means was to acquire people. That applied across Africa as well. It applied in China. It 
everywhere, right? So that, that uh, commodification of labor uh, was a driving force uh, shifting social relationships across the, across the globe. Uh, so, so I mean, at the end, at the end of, I mean, uh, in the at the end, what we call the no, not the end, around 15th century, there was a global labor crisis. <laughs> not just in Europe, even in Africa, because we were just going, we just got through uh, the, the the worst drought experience since since about 300 BC. You know, from uh, the little ice age, basically, it wiped out many, it, it, it changed the social structure in many societies. So we are also dealing with labor crisis in, in, the, in the 14th century, all the way to uh, the end of the 16th century, when there was some respite, which then allowed Oyo, for example, to begin to expand its boundaries, which is a, a, a strategy of managing future crisis by distributing its populations in different ecological zones so that if there is failure of of of, of crop here is other people in, in another area could support so it, it, different kingdoms were operating different strategies and of course on top of that the atlantic economy was opening up as well so we have to embrace multiple perspectives or multiple approaches to understand, to fully explain uh, uh, what was happening in the 17th, 18th century. The similar thing was happening in East Africa. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We have time potentially for one last question. Anyone has one? A quick question? I can ask it. One I've been trying to formulate, again, so apologies if it doesn't come out so well. If, I, I'm trying to think of sort of the implications of, of what you've just provided us with, which was, which was beautiful and fantastic, to contempt, very contemporary issues, right? So if we take um, many critiques of, of the uh, current forms of neoliberalism, mm -hmm. draw on, say, Habermas, right, and say that Habermas's argument that we've gone from a, an economic system which is about sustaining social relations in the world, mm -hmm. the, the life world, mm -hmm. to an economic system which is self-sustaining in its own right, and which is um, ignorant of those relationships and is is all consuming of them, right? And your case here is is a is a beautiful example of of that very process, I think. And so, but the current a problem that I feel feel we sit in currently is that the solution to that situation is often just to do more of the same, right? Mm -hmm. So the so solution to the problems of inequality and environmental degradation that are generated by that all-consuming economic system is often economic empowerment of people so that they become part of that system, right? So they, they then replicate it rather than challenge and question it. Mm -hmm. So the difficult question to you is how do we take your beautiful example of the way in which that all-consuming economic system causes incredible devastation mm -hmm. as an example for how we need to transform our current modernity. <laughs> okay, okay. Right. <laughs> well, well, well. well um, I think uh, we, we have to, first of all, uh, recognize that there's no economic system that doesn't have its uh, shortcomings. Capitalism, as we know, operates on the principle that wealth will continue to be generated. Right? That is the principle, that you continue to generate wealth. Somehow, Africans, most Africans, in, when you look at indigenous epistemology, they don't approach wealth that way. They see that wealth cannot, you cannot continue to generate wealth when the people are not being taken care of, right? When, 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 when people, when you don't value people, right? And you see that happening uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in West Africa as a result of that. that so inflation was increasing um, and because calories coming in were not being taken out by anyone, 
no one will like it. So Africa enter what I call soft currency, which Africa is still in that today. You can exchange pounds and dollars in the world market, but you can't exchange Naira, Nigerian Naira. Now we have about 200 million people using Naira. Naira has no value, right? Outside Nigeria. So Africa entered that soft currency and is still in that soft currency today, right? So what is the implication of that? Of course, people then develop their zero-sum game idea of capitalism, that you can only generate wealth from the labor of other people. This is not something that can reproduce itself. So if you are controlling the power of capitalism, then you can continue to generate wealth. But those people who are providing you the labor and the resources for it, they will continue to get marginally from it, from their rank, from the rank of their elite, they will get marginal gain, as Jengaya said. So African elite got marginal gain, but the majority of the people lost that. You know? So that, I think it's, uh, we, we need to pay, our policymakers need to pay attention to this kind of stories. Uh, perhaps if they pay attention to those stories, they will be able to rethink the model of of our liberal economy, our liberal capitalism, that you know, there's something there that may not be had enough eventually, or that will not have up eventually, and that uh, the chicken will come home to us. <laughs> yeah. We're not done now. Thank you, Akin. Uh, please join me in another round of applause on that as well. And with that, we'll close. And um, just a small reminder that we do ask that everyone leave the building as soon as possible after this. And another reminder about next week's event, where we'll welcome Lisa Ginkanto on the topic of living on Atlantic time commerce and daily life on the Gandhi River. You can expect registration link to email soon. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.